So I've actually just decided to repeat the whole series next year. It's the, the nature of my work is somewhat evolutionary and adaptive, so it'll be a, a new pass through the whole of social leadership next year with a few tweaks and modifications. In fact, um, one of the things I've been developing is some of the new work around story listening. So when I finished the last book uh, a, uh, a few months ago, it's the 100 Days book, it's got the whole section on storytelling. And I, I've since got quite interested in story listening and sort of the active skills for that. So it's particularly thinking around uh, more senior leaders, how do they listen to stories flowing up through the organization? So uh, come time to do the second edition of the 100 Days book, I'll be adding that in. I might test some of that in the webinar early next year. Oh, I look forward to uh, reading that, Julian. Sounds like a good, good addition to the ever-growing body of work. Um, just before you start, if I could just um, let everybody know that we're doing the session today, um, and we'll be sharing this with with everybody after the session for those who are here and those who haven't been able to make it so far. Um, so just keep in mind that we're recording it. And if you have any questions throughout the session, uh, the chat feature in Zoom um, is a really good way to, to, I guess, raise a hand or drop a question. Um, just make sure it's set to um, the panelists and all attendees rather than a private message. Uh, I'll, um, I guess I'll step into the background and move into the chat room. Uh, when Julian gets started, if anything crops up, I'll, I'll catch that. If, and Julian may spot it, and if not, I'll, I'll uh, let you know, Julian, that someone's raised the question. But other than that, uh, I'm going to hand over to you now, Julian, if I may, to um, start the, the 12th um, episode in this Social Leadership Webinar series. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll kick off as we hit the hour and uh, make the start. Just check. Sam, I think you've hit record, so it looks like we're running. Okay, well, there we are. Let's become formal as we're now into the formal part of the session. So thanks for joining uh, for this webinar, the, the uh, 12th in the series on uh, social leadership. We started off looking at some foundations of the social age and then ran through each of the uh, nine sections of the net model of social leadership, which I'll be revisiting later in this session. So in, in today's webinar, I guess in some ways I'm taking just a broad tour through social leadership again, but I've also um, tried to bring in uh, a lot of the material that I didn't use going through the, the series of webinars. Um, one of the things I try to do every time I, I do these presentations is, is build the deck from scratch because it's easy to fall into just talking about the same uh, aspects of social leadership. So I brought in a few uh, new areas today and I, uh, I want to start with uh, this. I, I normally start looking at the context of social leadership. And um, I do that thinking about organizations and individuals. Uh, so this is one of the illustrations from the 100 Days book. And I brought it in here because it's been in my mind the last few days. Um, I, I normally say that one of the primary roles of social leaders is to is to fight for fairness is to help to make their organizations better um, and recently i've been uh, looking in some detail around uh, social systems how systems work tribes communities societies organizations they're all um, they're all uh, groupings within social structures and um, the reason i'm sharing this slide is because um, one of the underlying themes of the social age is that factors which we used to call perhaps soft skills or we used to view as the kind of more emotional, touchy-feely side of relationships have probably become what we would have previously called hard skills. So uh, the notion of an organization that's fair probably confers a competitive advantage these days. Certainly there's evidence that it, it helps people attract talent in the US um, there was some research out recently showing that more than 50% of people make a final decision on whether to accept a job based on the glassdoors.com score. So if the organization is seen to be fair, sort of well connected with its community, 
then they're more likely to go and work there. And that again ties into uh, a core theme of the social age, which is that it's probably less important for organisations to have filled all the seats than it is for them to have the right people in those seats. Um, and in a time of fractured social contracts between organisations and individuals, at a time when the organisation no longer um, holds a career, ooh, I'm just going to check that you can uh, still see or hear me. I had a little glitch going on in the system there. If anybody is... There yeah. Go. Can you tell me? We've got you back now, Julian. Oh, did I drop out? Okay. I think I, I may have to. We're all back online. Can hear and see you now, so okay. I think we're good to carry on. Okay, I'm carrying on. And thanks, Martin, for letting me know there. I was getting a series of fleets, uh, but yes, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, and uh, sorry, so I'm just checking. Is my video running? I sort of lost the ability to see. Um, it, do we, we see your video and we can see the screen share. Okay, all right, thank you. So I'll that one. Um, so the, 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 uh, yeah, I was thinking I was talking about the social contracts between organisation and individual. Uh, when we no longer have a career that flows right through, when duration of service is, is likely to be measured in a few years rather than decades, um, it becomes more important for organisations to earn engagement to effectively um, create space for people to engage in the organisation. So I just wanted to start with this slide to, to touch on this idea. Social leadership is definitely um, something that's in this space of creating uh, a, a higher level of uh, sort of social responsibility and justice between the organisation and society it sits in. Not as a sense of corporate social responsibility, but simply because by having that reputation, it will be easier to attract the, the very talent that we need. If I move perhaps back into a, a more typical view of, of social leadership, it's this, it sits between the formal power that exists within the organization and the reputational power that sits within the community. And uh, again, one of the, the base definitions I, I give of social leadership is that uh, formal leadership is that which is given to you by the organization. So it's held within a hierarchy, within rules, systems and process, and the ability to apply formal consequence. So formal leaders can enforce the rules if they need to. Reputational power, which is a, what sits behind social leadership, is held in bonds of pride and trust, and we'll revisit trust uh, later, and is earned within the community. So one of the key notions within social leadership is that formal leaders may earn social leadership uh, if they put in the effort, uh, if they're humble enough to move beyond their formal power, whilst it's open to anybody to, uh, to be granted social leadership, again, if they earn it. It's this reputational notion that sits behind uh, social leadership. Now, um, this uh, slide is one that I, I put together about six months ago, and I find it, it very often sits right at the start of, of, of presentations that I do today, because it, it really illustrates, or it's intended to illustrate, um, the difference between the formal structure and the social structure. It's to set the context for that thinking. The formal structure of the organisation is everything that you can see and own and control around you. So it is, of course, all of the buildings, the computers, the technology, the assets. It also is the rule systems, the, um, those formal structures of, um, of power and the hierarchy itself. Um, the social structure which flows around it is what I've been most interested in recently. And there are some key differences just to illustrate between these two. So one key difference is there's only ever one formal structure. So no matter how big your organisation is, no matter how global and complicated it is, there's only one formal structure. Now, you may change it every day, but ultimately you can always draw it. You know, it's, it's the organisational chart and the lines of power and accountability. So there may be some curved lines and dotted lines, but effectively it's one dimensional and it's infinitely scalable. So as your organisation grows by acquisition, by merger, as you restructure, Everything you're doing takes place in that formal structure. Now, the social system, by contrast, can get bigger 
So as your formal organization gets bigger, your social structure gets bigger. But I've recently been looking at how does it scale? Because it doesn't scale in the same way. Um, it, it would seem that what happens is that our primary uh, cultural alignment is in what we could call tribal units. So the strong social ties that we have with people, the, the meaningful interpersonal relationships, those which are based on trust, shared values, um, respect, pride, they tend to sit in, in clumped tribal units. So as the social system gets bigger, we end up with more interconnected tribes. We're not evenly connected across the whole system. We're tightly connected in a hyper-local granular structure, and we're loosely connected across the wider system. So there's a structural difference in how formal systems scale and how social systems scale. So one of the themes that I'm looking at in terms of the socially dynamic organization, and I'll, I'll come back onto that term later, is that it's more interconnected. So if we're looking to develop social leadership, we're looking to increase the interconnectivity between those local tribes. So let me just pause and, and mention that term again, the socially dynamic organization. It's um, this year I've started using that term as a unifying principle around uh, much of my work to say that at the moment, we typically have sort of legacy organizations, which are uh, formally uh, codified. They're based in this formal structure. What we probably need to build are more socially dynamic organizations. So they'll still have really wonderfully strong social structures because the uh, apologies, formal structure, they'll be very strong in the formal space, but they will also recognize, empower, enable, and understand the social structure. Um, and the real shift in my understanding has been that our responsibility isn't to make the formal structure better because it's often pretty good already we need to find ways to recognize and gain access to the social structure so that's kind of a foundation um, around much of my work and indeed especially with the trust research this year i've been trying to look at how does this social structure work because not only is it held in bonds of, of trust and pride it's also multi-layered and contextual and often conflicting. So um, whilst I said you only ever have one formal structure, you have multiple concurrent overlapping social structures. So we may all trust each other right now in this context, but later today in a different context, we may trust each other less. And there are some uh, structural parts of this which are worth understanding. Um, for example, one of the outputs from the trust research is that people trust formal technology uh, about 30% less than they trust social technology. So if within the formal system we try to give our communities um, technologies to connect to be effective, we have to recognise that if we own and control those, social, uh, those uh, technologies within the formal structure, people may trust them less. And this is uh, quite a significant issue. It, it really represents, I, I could say, it represents the decline of domain specific power. So much of what we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years of organizational development is the rise of domain specific power. So IT functions, legal functions, compliance functions. And we're seeing the erosion of some of that. So an IT function which relies on owning and controlling technology and implementing it at scale is somewhat out of kilter with the way that social structures operate with socially moderated technology, typically diverse ecosystems of technology and technologies over which the community itself retains ownership, power and control. So again, just back to this widest context of the social age, uh, this is a, a slide I, I again often start with. Um, and it, it, it's really these last two uh, clouds which are most relevant. When I say we're substantially through the digital age, it's because my focus is on these um, social aspects of interconnectivity. We still have, of course, incredible, wonderful, transformative technology, and, and I've been doing some fun work around that recently, looking at the psychology of mixed realities. You know, how do we behave differently in um, virtually enabled uh, social collaborative spaces? But fundamentally, the skills we need to be developing in the organisation are those ones of uh, social connectivity, of interconnectedness, what we could broadly 
bundled together as social capital. That's the term I use in the paper, the social leadership. Now, uh, what can be interesting is to consider the types of power that sit behind this. And this um, stream of work here has actually come out of some of the work I've been doing with the military, predominantly in the US, but looking at types of power. And I think it, it applies in all social contexts. And it looks at these, um, these three types of power. So individual power is your, if you like, your charismatic power. It's directly applied. Individual power probably factors strongly in those local tribal units. So if you, draw, if you um, enter an organization and you join a team that's based in a particular office. It's your ability to be in that physical space, to smile at people, to make connections, to offer to make them a coffee. You know, it's those charismatic aspects of power which probably contribute directly to your primary cultural alignment, your, your ability to join uh, and be part of that local tribe. At scale, organizations are built upon hierarchical power. And hierarchical power is obviously that which sits within the formal structure of the organization. So hierarchical power is the mechanism of scale. But of course, charismatic power doesn't carry through hierarchies. What carries beyond the immediate is networked power, reputation-based authority. Now, uh, the reason I'm using this slide, which shows the struggle for control, is because it's, it's quite interesting. Um, networked power isn't just a different flavor of hierarchical power. It's a fundamentally different type of power. And again, this has been one of my own um, sort of breakthrough moments in terms of understanding. Because the, the reason I say it's different is because you can disrupt hierarchical power by disrupting the hierarchy. If you break down the, the communication within a hierarchy, you, you disrupt it. Um, and indeed, when we go through organizational change, we often disrupt that formal hierarchy and structure. Interestingly, networked power, if we attempt to disrupt it, is often enforced and enabled. It's often validated and empowered by our attempts to disrupt it or deny it. So this is why certain rebellious uh, dissenting voices can get strongly socially amplified. And it is in, in, interestingly the reason why we've ended up with, with uh, President Trump in America, because he deploys a, a sort of oppositional networked reputation based type of power and we see that more widely as well if you're interested in that if you look on the blog just search for trump you'll find three uh, primary articles i've written about exactly um, the application of this in political spaces or if you just search for types of power you'll find some of the um, work that sits underneath this but i think understanding power is important to understand the social aspect of the organization and it also um, is fundamentally about uh, a shift. So the social age has generally seen um, a reduction in formal power and uh, 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 the ascent of socially moderated power. It's a leveling of voices between formal and social systems. So uh, this model of social leadership, which I originally um, published in 2014, has, has formed the backbone of, 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 um, of this work around social leadership. And it's really, for me, a way of understanding or, or viewing uh, the development journey, if you like. I'm not gonna go deep into this uh, here, but this is the structure I've been following through these 12 webinars. And it sits behind both the Social Leadership Handbook and the 100 Days book. I'll just quickly skim through it and try and relate it to what I've said already. So it starts with curation on the left. So curation, storytelling, and sharing are three foundational skills for social leaders. The ability to choose your space. So in the formal system, you're given a space, but in the social system, you, you choose your space. Um, and it's about curating uh, content, bringing things which add value. So relevant, timely, adding value. About being an expert storyteller. So we have to understand how stories work and how they flow through systems. And this is about understanding features of social filtering, social moderation and amplification. And I'll touch more on those later. And then sharing, sharing to add signal rather than noise. We live in very noisy worlds and social leadership is about cutting through that noise. The, the next part is about really your source of power. So community reputation and authority. 
is about understanding the communities that we're part of, the many different communities. And then of course, skill set about how we join communities, how we grow communities, and of course, how we leave communities. Because one way um, of reducing some of the noise is to take ourselves out of some communities. I've also been picking this work up again recently in the trust research. And I'm not gonna share that content today, but I'll just um, say if you're interested in search on the blog for tribes, you'll see that recently I've been looking at how some forces like confirmation bias, unconscious bias and implicit association mean that when we grow the size of our network, because networks grow predominantly through first and second degree trust connections, we don't automatically diversify our network. We may just grow it bigger whilst remaining very narrow. As social leaders, we probably have to engage increasingly in difference to diversify our network out of those comfortable spaces. Then reputation into authority is really the heart of social leadership. We earn our reputation over time and we are awarded social authority based on that reputation that we've earned. For me, that's almost the most exciting part of the whole story. The final part is about what we achieve with social leadership, co-creation, and how as social leaders we have to hold open spaces for co-creation. That notion of holding open spaces is one that comes back to me again and again when I'm thinking about um, social learning, when I'm thinking about social leadership, and when I'm thinking about change. We, our role is to hold open the space, it's not to have the answers, it's not to exert formal power, it's to hold open space and ensure people have high social capital so they're able to operate in that space to be effective social leaders and ultimately to collaborate uh, widely both inside the organization and outside it. So um, I'll just drop into a couple of the, if you like, the uh, couple of aspects of that in a bit more detail. Um, think about some of the fundamentals. Uh, I don't want to get too philosophical about it, but knowledge itself is, is fundamentally different in the social age. So we've moved from a time when organisations owned, controlled and codified knowledge. They had knowledge bases and knowledge management systems. And to a large extent, your individual power was founded upon what you knew and your ability to control access to it. Now, of course, today, the types of knowledge we engage with most often are are dynamic, co-created, adaptive, evolutionary. Um, they may not be perfect, but our ability to discern what's valid, um, to discern what's useful, is incredibly important. I was actually uh, slightly infuriated in the, at an event in the US the other day when, when the leader of the event I was at said, we're not going to talk about numbers and research and facts here. We're going to, we're going to draw upon what we feel to be true. Well, you know, feelings are good, but um, there's a place for knowledge. I don't subscribe to the, the current narrative about sort of fake news and fake facts. There is an underlying process of validating knowledge, which is clearly very important. If we don't understand um, the dynamics of the pollution of knowledge, um, if we don't understand um, the corruption of that, then uh, we run the risk of being uh, unwillingly led or willingly led, I should say, into, into dark places. So there's, there's more work to be done on this, but suffice to say, an aspect of social leadership is to recognize that individually, we may not be able to pick our way through all this noise, but as a community, we can. So communities are sense-making entities to give us access to knowledge, to help create knowledge and meaning and to, to validate it, to understand what's really valuable. Now, stories are a part of this. Stories are the basic mechanism of cultural transmission. And um, in social leadership, I look at three levels of stories, personal stories, co-created stories, and organizational stories. And we can get a long way by understanding the tension between those three. So personal stories tend to be highly authentic, but based upon that charismatic individual reputational power. Formal stories told by the organization tend to be beautifully produced and can be pushed um, at, at, at strength through the system, but they, uh, they may lack authenticity. Now, co-created stories are what's put together by the community themselves. Co-created stories aren't stories of agreement. They're often stories of shared difference. And, and that's a, a notion which I think is very valuable uh, to understand 
how we can capture our shared differences in stories. Now, Martin's just asking, how big a risk is there that communities and tribes continually reinforce their own biases, splitting apart if disagreements emerge? Current experience suggests adding diversity is really hard unless diversity uh, is itself a core value for community or organization. Well, this is a, a big point, Martin, and um, I'm very interested in this. And in fact, um, later this afternoon, I'm running uh, the Trust Research Partner webinar, where I, I'm looking explicitly at this through some of the um, research over the last couple of months. And I'll also share with you after this a, a recent um, piece of writing around tribes, which um, I've been looking at. So there is a big risk that uh, communities reinforce their own bias. We, we, we know that. Um, so as we build communities of difference, the diversity of those communities, the diversity of thinking, um, and of course, all types of diversity become a strength. So one could argue that um, uh, part of a core skill of social leadership is to build communities of difference rather than communities of similarity. The angle of this that I'm focusing on is our ability uh, to write stories of difference. So instead of saying, I disagree with you, for us to come together to write a shared story about the aspects we disagree on. Um, in the work on trust, I've been uh, trying to, to look at this, you know, um, how do, what is the mechanism by which these communities fracture? Now, the, the, the research is showing that people primarily express that the community fractures when implicit rules are broken okay so um, it doesn't fracture when a formal rule is broken uh, for 75 percent of people it's when implicit rules are broken so that's the angle that i'm trying to uh, follow through this but you know you're, you're obviously bang on the money this is what we need to understand it's not about growing larger communities of um, commonality it's about uh, growing larger communities of difference. So if you like, a core skill for social leaders becomes the agility to move between those different communities. In the Social Leadership Handbook, I look at um, around nine uh, specific roles that a leader takes within uh, those different communities. So sometimes it's a leadership role, sometimes it's a storytelling role, but one of the roles is a cross-connecting role. So you'll have heard me use that word earlier around interconnectivity and in social leadership it's cross-connecting role so effectively if i can carry you into multiple different communities or if you are connected in many different communities that inherently um, will make you a valued uh, social leader in the organization it's harder for formal leaders to do that so i'd encourage you if you're interested in that aspect follow the work on tribes and and, and um come and join in the, the, the trust work as well. Uh, these are the dominant social forces I'm exploring in that work. So um, social filtering, uh, I'm just uh, looking at a couple of the, the core skills, if you like, of social leaders here. You know, taking all of the stories, all that noise in the system, social filtering is what high functioning communities do, leaving us with the stories which are most relevant and timely. And and this notion of filtering signal from noise is absolutely essential. And I'm seeing now in some of, the, some of our larger scale case studies, what I'm observing is that um, some local tribes are extremely good at this, even when organizations as a whole are, are very poor at it. So um, filtering signal from noise is, is, is clearly a, a, a key uh, skill. I'm going to just plow on at a bit of speed because uh, I've got a lot in here. So if, if we sort of pause and say, what is social leadership? Well, it's maybe about um, being uncertain. In a formal system, leaders have to often demonstrate strength um, by taking a clear path of action. Social leaders um, can share their uncertainty. That notion of sharing uncertainty is something that I often equate with the humility of social leaders. Being unafraid to share uncertainty um, is an important aspect of that. Uh, sometimes I write about this under the context of working out loud, you, you know, sharing your evolving thinking and understanding. You can't do that if you're trying to be brilliant at every moment or if you're fearful of consequence being applied. And some of the work I've been able to do on this, it's quite hard to do research in this space. 
Um, but for example, uh, one of the things I've been able to do is interview military aircraft technicians in the US military, uh, about 40 of those, about where they go to solve their intractable engineering problems. And the number one place they go is WhatsApp. And that's interesting because the military, of course, spends a lot of money on secure um, social collaborative technologies. But people seem to choose to uh, go to these private spaces. And that probably relates to that aspect of trust I talked about earlier, that um, they trust it more because they own and control access to it. Uh, and that, incidentally, is something I, I, I've observed widely elsewhere in social learning. If people control access to a space, they're more likely to engage. In one of the uh, programs I ran, where the community owned the control of access, they engaged 16 times higher than in communities where an HR team owned uh, the access and control. But those military aircraft technicians described how they curated content of a problem, they shared video, they assembled a community of trusted individuals and they solved the problem. But interestingly, they also described how they would bring in people at a second degree of trust. And this is really important. So they'd build a community of first degree of trust. That's their local tribe. But in order to solve a problem, they were willing to bring in people at a second degree of trust. So if I said to the group of you here, will you help me solve it? And you all said, yes, but can we bring in this other expert? Based on my relationship with you, I would carry the trust over to a second degree. Nobody in that group I interviewed um, discussed a third degree of trust. They would go as far as the second degree. So these are the mechanisms by which uh, communities grow. But to Martin's question from earlier, um, because our communities probably grow through first and second degrees of trust, that in itself does hold us within a frame of bias. You know, we, we tend to grow communities that are similar to us in, in some ways. Um, so social leadership, you know, cons considers this, you know, who, who would you follow and why? We have to understand this, you know, think about this ourselves. Why would we follow someone? Well, you know, one of the skills of a social leader is, is to be generous. You know, being generous is, is a, a hard skill, but not just about money, not being generous with money, being generous with your connections, being generous with your time, um, being generous with a spirit of support. But generosity and sharing, are clearly uh, a strong part of social leadership. And again, it ties into that theme I started with. The old hard skills uh, may now be matched by what we would have called softer um, interpersonal uh, skills, which now achieve an effect at scale. Um, th this is uh, a slide, actually, this is the first time I've ever shared this slide. Um, in fact, uh, a number of these slides I've not used before. They're illustrations from the 100 Days book. But I brought this in because quite an important part of social leadership is to, is to set your rules, you know, your understanding. This, um, funnily enough, so the, very simple, these are the three rules that I, I use myself in, in my uh, sort of public social spaces. Uh, so uh, anybody that's followed uh, my writing from the start in, in 2010 will have seen this. I, I try to always bring um, a, a positive tone to my writing you know I, I, I won't criticize um, unless I'm adding um, unless I'm adding solutions or value so I try to be constructive in, in what I do and responsive um, you know that for me those are rules that work but we have to actively curate our rules if we don't then we'll just be uh, reacting to circumstance rather than uh, consciously thinking about what we do and again you know, taking action is important. Again, this is a, a, one of the illustrations from the uh, 100 Days book. And it, it, every 10th day in that book is about taking action. Because uh, social leadership isn't something we think about. It's, it's a, a value that we have to, to live as we go. Um, early next year, I'm publishing a quite major book on change, on organisational change. And it's based around the notion of six-week change. So if you, if you can't see and measure and observe change in six weeks, it's probably not because your tools aren't carefully calibrated enough. It's probably because nothing's changing. So uh, there is a strong action focus uh, to social leadership. I think that's important. It's practical and applied. So let's um, think about, you know, where is it practical and applied? Well, often it comes down to culture. And one of the challenges we face within the formal structure of the organization 
is the notion of aspirational culture. Much of the work that's done on organizational culture is held in this aspirational space. We talk about values, you know, we could, we could walk today into some of the big banks in, in London or New York and they would have, you know, on the walls of the lift or in the lobby, it would say, uh, trust, honesty, integrity. And, you know, they're nice words, but just, just wearing the badge that says it doesn't make it to be true. It's aspirational. Um, social leadership is firmly in that dominant space of culture. So it's in the lived experience of culture. And social leaders are effective because they engage with people in that space. So culture is co-created in the moment through every action. Um, I talked about storytelling earlier and this notion is important. So uh, the stories that social leaders tell don't need to be perfect because they're not being judged and assessed by an organization. We weave stories of difference and of similarity. And that's really key to it. You know, it, we have to be able to come together with people and say, we do disagree, but this is the structure of our disagreement. I ran a, a quite challenging uh, session with a group of 250 student nurses in the UK uh, last year, where I, I said to them, you know, that the, the inherent challenge of the NHS sits with you in this room, because we're 250 nurses together complaining about how everybody else is at fault. But unless you are having 250 conversations with the people that you disagree with, not to colonize their space with your views, but to understand the nature of that difference, then we're not really affecting change. We're observing the challenge rather than uh, truly uh, taking part within it. I'm going to um, jump forward through a couple of slides here. Uh, just forgive me for doing that, but uh, in these sessions, I, I sometimes uh, add in a bit more content than I'm going to get through. Uh, but uh, I wanted to um, just touch again on, on some of these. Um, and this perhaps relates to um, Martin's point again earlier around communities of difference. One of the things that uh, social leaders like to do effectively is that cross connection. Um, so in the example I used about the military aircraft technicians, carry people through to a second degree of trust, make introductions. Now for this to happen, you need these, this backdrop of trust to be in place. But um, a socially dynamic organization will gain its strength from that, that strong interconnectivity. So who's gonna give us that? Not the formal leadership of the organization. Formal leaders and formal power can only work in formal spaces. We need to move beyond that. So this for me is a, is a key argument of why we need to put effort into developing social leadership because left to our own devices we will continue to grow our communities based on what we need but if the organization is to benefit from being more socially dynamic we need to enable and empower communities um, to do this to, to, to broaden and diversify their, their links to do that we need this high social authority you remember in the the model of social leadership earlier. I, I talked about that link between reputation and authority. And the interesting thing about reputation is you can't buy it. You can't be given it by an organization. You can only earn it within your community. So there's a, uh, there's a piece about consistency of action over time is what gives us social leadership. It's what gives us our reputation and what will earn us our social authority. So what does that mean from an organizational imperative? Well, it's interesting. I'm increasingly, uh, you know, finding myself in conversations where organizations want to benefit from co-creation. They recognize the power of the community. And I, I, I carried out a briefing at the Pentagon um, a couple of months ago to a group of about 40 senior military leaders. And it was very interesting. When I came out of that meeting, I wrote an article called The Fear. And it typified the conversation I have in all sorts of organizations where they recognize that communities uh, hold this tacit tribal devolved wisdom and, and they can really benefit from it. We really understand that. But at the same time, they're terrified of relinquishing the control, which will give us access to that co-creation. Uh, one of the, the global banks based in New York, I visited them recently and they, they um, are carrying out a big learning transformation project. And we're really saying, you know, how can we unlock this power of community? But when we looked at it, it didn't take long to discover that they used a formal 
social collaboration tool. They have an organizational instance of Yammer, but they control it. It's fully moderated and you're not allowed to share images on it. And it really spoke of this um, friction within the system. So the legal team was worried that if people shared images, they might accidentally breach copyright. Now, that's a legitimate concern. You know, people may do that. Um, however, um, if you lock the system down, you're not stopping people from sharing. They're just going to be sharing those images elsewhere and out of sight. But what you are doing is, is imposing rules and destroying that aspect of social collaboration within the system. So one of the things I sort of encourage organizations to do is invest in co-creation. It, it's not a prize you can claim. It's a prize that you may be awarded if you create the conditions, if the organization acts fairly, if it invests in its community, and if it gives it freedom, then you may be rewarded by co-creation. It requires a, a different mindset. From an individual point of view, humility is the foundation of social leadership. And again, I, 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 I say this um, in a, a recognition that, you know, it's, it's an easy thing to say, you know, oh, it's nice to be humble. Well, you know, for sure it is. But there's a certain uh, importance now. Humility carries greater weight than it ever would have done before. Uh, and it's two-sided. Um, uh, I'm doing some work with the federal government in, in Canada around the evolution of democracy and, and the impacts of technology and, and social leadership within that. And it's an interesting thing. We often criticize our, our politicians for being sort of disconnected um, or for flip-flopping, you know, for moving between opinions. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because if, if we're humble and willing to learn, then we have to be able to change our view over time. We, you, you know, part of working out loud is to say, this is what I think, or that's what I used to think, but now I think this thing. So there's an individual skill of humility, which is being willing and humble enough to listen to others and change your view. But there's also an organizational or even a societal responsibility to hold open a space for people to change their view. Uh, if we view it cynically, then we're probably clamping down on that ability to change. This notion of sharing uncertainty is very important. If you feel that you have to have the answer, then you're less likely to, to share uncertainty. And if you're interested in this, if you search on the blog for uh, consequence, I've been looking at consequence as one of these underlying forces. Um, the application of formal consequence and social consequence is uh, very important. Social consequence is a dominant force. It causes people to stay in an existing space, to not raise their hand. So um, one of the questions we ask ourselves is where will we hear new voices? And again, this relates uh, back to your point, Martin, earlier about, um, about bias. If we exist in the same communities and we just make our communities bigger but broadly stay the same, we won't hear new voices new voices that give us a different perspective, that set a different context, fresh voices, voices that challenge us. Voices of dissent is really important. Um, and I don't mean dissent or subversion in a negative way of people trying to break things for no reason. I mean um, the organizational graffiti. The, the graffiti is a voice that's claimed when no space is given with permission. But we can learn from reading the graffiti. We can read the temperature of the organization. It's a great thing for leaders to gain access, to be privileged with access to those voices of dissent, but it won't be given to us. We have to earn the right to hear it. So this for me is, is a key imperative for, um, for developing social leadership. And our social leaders will be attuned to their communities. They'll be able to hear conversations. And again, I'll use this word, we will be privileged if we are allowed to hear the voices that we disagree with. Quite often, um, and rightly so, organizations say to me, how will we know if it's working? How can we measure success? And I say only slightly lightheartedly, the, um, the, there are two measures we will probably uh, be able to see. One is that we will hear stories of dissent. So if we have developed and are developing stronger social leadership, if we're more attuned to our communities, we will hear dissenting voices. In a strongly controlled system, people won't dissent because social consequence and formal consequence are too high. But the second measure is that 
if we are becoming socially dynamic, we will be willing to hear those stories and do something about them. If we respond with formal power to try to own or control or, or say that we've got it covered, we just destroy that connection. And that's why I've been looking uh, most recently at story listening, the ability, the willingness of the organization to listen to these stories. Sometimes we feel that our challenge is to get people to speak, but actually our challenge is to learn how to listen and um, to recognize that we exist in this globally differentiated space. Many of us will be in organizations that cross over not just geographical boundaries, they cross over legal, moral and ethical boundaries. Um, there are 79 countries in the world where homosexuality is not yet, is either illegal or not yet decriminalized. I, I presented around this in Singapore uh, last week where um, a, a country where it, um, uh, homosexuality is, uh, is not illegal but it's not yet decriminalized and there have been at least four politically motivated prosecutions in the last five years. Now, we can sort of take a view, well, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because if people are unable to engage authentically in, in social spaces, technology may bring us together, like the technology we're using today brings us together, but it doesn't give us shared values or principles. Not everybody has as loud a voice. Um, people are disempowered for all sorts of reasons. And an interesting sideline on this is the trust research. So the, uh, I won't get deep into it, I think Sam has shared a link earlier. Um, the landscape of trust research is the largest study in the world I'm running this year about trust. And so far in the initial analysis, and I should stress this is early stage analysis, but gender is the strongest factor uh, impacting in every single dimension that I'm measuring are gender-based differences in the understanding and experience of trust. The second biggest difference is technology. And the third biggest is age. People often think age will be the, the strongest factor, but it isn't. So we have to do more work to understand this and be able to engage across our shared differences. So I've just got a few slides I'll run through just to sort of um, uh, pull together the, the end of this journey, if you like. And we'll have some time for, for questions as well. I'll do post any any questions as we go. Again, I, I'm always sort of wary of platitudes and saying, uh, saying things which just sort of sound nice, but social leaders do what's right, not just what's easy. I think this is very important. Um, and I'm quite explicit about this, even with organizations. If you develop social leadership, you are accepting fundamentally that you are building a type of leader that may stand up to you in the future, that may just say, what you are doing is not right. And, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, the gender pay gap is an ongoing issue in all of our societies. It's only in Iceland that women have gone on strike to try to close the gender pay gap. And in the UK, uh, the, the gender pay gap is closing, but it's closing very slowly. The, the last estimate, um, I, I did some work with the UN a month or two ago, and, and the estimate that was shared there was uh, that it, it will take 170 years at the current rate that the gender pay gap is closing. But how many organisations are willing to commission a, a blind study of every role and remuneration within the organisation uh, to say, well, these people that are paid less should be paid more, or these people that are paid more should be paid less. That's how you close the gender pay gap. But we don't do it because of normalised inequality. We accept it, we talk about it, but we don't actually do it um, and this is a challenge because as a social leader you can't uh, tolerate inequality um, one of the um, aspects of the trust work which I'm just starting to prototype uh, concerns the notion of organizational pollution and it's when we have a, a deep-seated social imperative to do one thing but we're prevented from doing so by the formal structure of the organization. And I should be clear, this isn't about bad organizations doing bad things. I barely believe there is any such thing as a, a bad organization or bad people trying to do bad things. But we do exist within systems as a whole, which perpetuate inequality. We have to put the blame somewhere. And broadly speaking, it sits with all of us. It's not just the people who um, perpetuate inequality it's the community which permits it um, and again I, I've been uh, writing on this recently 
looking at normalized um, inequality and how we have to tackle it at a, 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 a community base, at a cultural level. So social leaders do what's right. They, they stand up. And I say without any trace of irony, they stand up whatever the cost. Uh, I was struck by this, by a friend actually, who was an HR leader in quite a large mining company, a global mining company, and um, traveled widely and was going through fertility treatment so said to her organization for these six months while I'm going through this treatment, I'll be unable to travel. And they fired her for it. They came up with a reason to get her out. Now, because she's an HR leader, she knows the process and they played the game, went to a tribunal and ended up with a, an out of court settlement. But they knew, the organization knew that they could remove her from the system just by paying the, the price. The interesting thing was me, for me was, as she went through that process, uh, a, a, an HR uh, legal process, uh, she was able to have another member of the executive be with her, to be her friend through that process. And it was a conversation she recounted to me about that leader who said, I think what we are doing is wrong. He said, I think what we're doing is wrong. And she told me that story. And I said to her, I don't want to hear that story if he's telling you that. I only want to hear it if he's standing up in front of the rest of the board saying, this is what we're doing and it's wrong and if we don't make it right i'll quit because if you're not prepared to stand up for what's right you're tolerating inequality and the toleration of inequality is what perpetuates it it's not the one person doing the bad thing it's the wider systemic pollution from that so you know social leaders have to stand up and leave nobody voiceless within the system. And again, I share this without a trace of irony. This is not some kind of hippie view about how we have to be nice to people. It's about if we want strong, socially dynamic organizations, we have to fight for them. And crucially, it's in the power, it's in the, it's in the interest of the organization to be socially dynamic. And why do I say that? Well, it's quite interesting. Uh, at the moment, you know, I'm engaged with a range of clients who are paying a lot of money to recapture innovation to be innovative, to be able to change. But the sad truth is, it's those very organizations which have engineered out their ability to be innovative. There are only two types of innovation you can bet on. There's radical innovation where you come up with this great idea that disrupts a market and steals the future. Or there's a distributed type of innovation. And that's the type of innovation in a strongly interconnected organization, which is able to be marginally more effective at scale. And that's really important. That is achievable for any of us, but it requires all sorts of action. It requires action on the individual. None of us, it turns out, none of, not even me, none of us are perfect. Um, it, change starts with ourselves. It doesn't start with looking at others. It starts with ourselves. And social leadership is very much about that. So we start with ourselves, but we end up in a space of complex, collaboration not collaborating on the things that's easy to collaborate on not just collaborating on things which sit within our functional unit and entity but complex collaboration throughout a deeply interconnected organization how will we get there well by developing an ability to experiment again people often say to me what are the best organizations you see and it's easy to answer the best organizations are ones that are not strong because they have loads of money and fantastic offices and you know beautiful people running them. They're strong because they have a deeply embedded methodology around curiosity. They understand how to experiment. They hold those experiments deep within their communities. They rely less on formal power, more on the ability to learn what to do and what's just right. And within that, they have leaders that don't just observe change. They, they actively take part in it, start with ourselves, build the communities around and effect change. So uh, let me sort of summarize and, and, and do feel free to post uh, questions uh, if you have them. Social leaders say thank you. You know, so I, I sort of say thank you at the end of the, the, this uh, journey through the aspects of social leadership. But awarding thanks is interesting. You can even um, use technology to do this. One of the most interesting experiments I've been involved in is working in an organization 
where at the end of the, every week through an app, people allocate thank yous. They hand out free thank yous. And you can aggregate that at scale through the organization. And it's fascinating because they don't all accumulate with the formal leaders. The thank yous accumulate with the social leaders within the system. It's the hidden layer that you're able to visualize. But understanding that flow of thanks is very important. Now, um, just while I'll let you uh, type any questions, we've got, uh, I think we've got seven or eight minutes left, but just um, whilst you're, you're thinking of any questions, I just thought I'd, I'd share a little about where I'm looking to take uh, the work on social leadership next. Um, well, as you'd have heard me mention a few times, uh, I'm interested in complex human social systems. And, and if, if we ask the question, which social systems are complex? The answer is every social system is complex. And we're never going to be able to model it and reduce it. Although I did have a, a really wonderful afternoon in New York a month or two ago with, uh, I was doing some work with the, the, uh, a group of mathematicians at Facebook. And uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, they have some good mathematicians. And we were talking about these complex dynamics of community. And they were saying, we think we can model it. And for one glorious moment, uh, we, I sort of felt we had this shared understanding. And then of course, uh, it sort of drifted apart uh, because we didn't share enough language. You know, we couldn't quite see that. But I'm interested in the forces that act upon social communities. I've talked about trust already, but pride is interesting. I've been able to work in a law firm to try to map a pride network. And that's very interesting to see where people find their pride. Um, I'm looking in more detail at cultural alignment. So the notion of a primary cultural alignment, which is probably what sits within your tribe, and a secondary cultural alignment, which is what sits in the larger organization. They're probably entirely separate things. Primary cultural alignment forms in a matter of hours into days and is then reinforced over weeks, months and years. Secondary cultural alignment, your ability to navigate the fully dynamic culture of the organization probably takes several years to fully form. So if we can think about that and start to work on how do we build secondary cultural alignment faster, that might be interesting. I've also become interested in the taxonomy of these social systems. What are tribes? How do tribes relate to communities, to wider organizations, even out into society? Now that taxonomy won't be right yet, but that's interesting for me. There seem to be clear dominant tribal forces. Um, and if we understand them, we can start to work uh, within them. So um, thank you for your time today. If you're interested in, in, in social leadership, the previous 11 webinars are all up on uh, YouTube. Uh, I've got a full MOOC, which is going to launch uh, slightly later this year around, um, around uh, social leadership. And of course, I, I continue to work out loud upon all aspects of this. I also have a, a, um, an explorer community and I'll, I'll ask Hannah to, to circulate a, a, an email round to the group uh, if you want to join that, it's an open community of interested explorers of the social age around the world. We have a weekly, I write a weekly newsletter to that group, just providing uh, a reflection within that community. And we run the monthly uh, open webinars. Now, um, Madhu, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Madhu, you said, uh, what are your thoughts on how an organization gets started with creating more social leadership focus? Well, um, I'll give you the sort of simple answer to that. There are two ways of doing this. In some organizations, you know, you'll have a leadership layer who understands the need for social leadership and wants to create opportunities for that to take place. So they'll create a space for, um, for, for that development work to happen. In other organizations, people will claim a permission. And that's really, um, that was the, the thought behind my last book, which is on, on social leadership in my first 100 days. It's a practical 100-day journey into social leadership. And right now, I've got some groups around the world that are just getting on with it. So they're, 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 they're taking hold of that, and they're developing their own social leadership and trying to sort of infect the organization and spread out their roots within it. Other organizations take a view that they recognize it and they want to develop it. Um, so perhaps consider within your own organization um, 
what 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 stage it's at you know um in the change work i talk about uh, constrained or resistant organizations so is your organization actively deploying antibodies to kill these conversations about change or does it want to change and unlock this but it, it may lack the understanding of how um, and then perhaps you can uh, you know find a space to have that conversation uh, based around that notion if you if you search on the um, blog for uh, change you'll find about 75 primary articles exploring that change framework including I've, I've published there a couple of chapters from the new book and the book should be out um, early in the uh, in the new year so uh, thank you for that question um, uh, it, does anybody have any other uh, questions that they would like to bring in? I think both uh, we have any other questions there. Feel free to post any if you'd like. Um, next year, just I'll tell you while this is going on, I say I think I'm going to rerun the full series of 12 social leadership ones, but bringing in the newer work. I'm also going to be running monthly um, explorer webinars so those will be for that explorer community and they'll be open um, and they'll be following the, the latest research and work I've been doing in the last month and then also uh, I'm now running the monthly trust webinars for the trust research partners so again we're starting to, to build that uh, build that out so uh, we're just coming up to the hour uh, let me just check did we have um, uh, yes, at a, at a practical level, maybe the question is, do you, do you consult with companies? Yes, of course, you know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, CSALT is the organisation I, I used to do that in, I'm always um, happy to do that. But I do have a principle of working out loud. So all of um, my work and all of the work we do is, is shared uh, openly in that space. But of course, um, we also uh, are always happy to, to engage to, uh, you know, to help organisations through that journey. So Sam, I'll, I'll hand it back to, to wrap up. We're, we're getting an hour, so I think we'll wrap up fast. Thank you everybody for your, uh, coming in and uh, being part of the session today. Yeah, Julian, Julian thank you very much. That's a, a very interesting wrap up to this, um, this 12 episode uh, series on social leadership. Thank you to everyone who's joined today and across all of those sessions. Uh, if you want to catch up with any of those, they're all available on uh, YouTube and you can find those from Julian's blog or from the CSALT Learning website. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be back soon. Uh, so thanks again, Julian. A really great session. I appreciate it. I've, I've got some good feedback from other people. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay.